Hello, um, I'm Paul Wilkinson. I'm currently filming and working out in Nepal. I've been here for the last five and a half years making a documentary series about Nepali culture and about um, shamanism. Uh, Travelling all over Nepal and going into the various regions and working with different shamanic groups. Um, today I want to show you a few objects from far west Nepal. So these masks are cast in metal and they, you can see they're very roughly cast and they're from Jadrakot which is um, fairly far west of Nepal and you have a shamanic figure here between two, two horns and um, I think they're probably a, a goat it's been cast um, hand cast using the lost wax technique so they'll have made the made the mask using beeswax, um, probably from the wild honey that they gather, um, which is a sort of shamanic hallucinogenic honey. Um, and they'll make the, the whole thing like this, um, rolling out the pieces. It's quite, you can see the wax is quite rough. Um, and you can see the little marks where they've, they've used some hand tools to smooth it out a very nice object, it's very tactile, very nice to hold and uh, you can feel that, that sort of human hand present in it. So they'll, with, with one like this, they'll have um, made a, a clay mould around it um, and then poured the, poured the molten metal into the mould and uh, they make, first of all, they make the wax, wax thing, wax mask, and then they uh, make the mold around it, and then they burn the wax out. So that's why it's called lost wax. So the wax burns away and melts away. And then they pour the metal into the void. And then when it's uh, pulled down, they crack the whole thing open, and out comes the mask. Well, this is really extraordinary and it's it's the first time I've ever seen a, sh a shamanic mask like that. It's a much more complicated mask with a, a big nose and a nose ring and uh, they've welded on a section here or riveted on a section here on the chin and riveted on a, a headband. Um, so this this they might well have had feathers and things tucked in in the top of this, in this ridge. So it represents the, uh, the shaman traveling from different, through the different worlds on the back of his horse and the deer down here with antlers. Um, very abstracted ear with earrings and nose rings and another nose ring and then the, a snake or naga and another snake and naga with the the moon and the sun, so it's travelling from one world to another. So very, very nice. But you can see it's been handmade and then hand cast. And these things are just a one-off. They they um, they break the mould when they when they make it, um, and so you never get a second one. You see the rivets here, where they've they've made it a bit more complicated and larger gently put in. I've not seen these um, danced yet but I plan to be going to West Nepal to try and seek these out later in the year. So these are from uh, even further West Nepal, um, very far west in a very remote area and they're cast in iron and they're from the Mugga people. So the Mugga people are um, their main religion is, is or spiritual path is still shamanism, although they come from a Tibetan root, so they, they're also Buddhist and Hindu and tantric, sort of tantric bomb. Um, so this represents a, a shaman with a, a very large um, bell chain harness. So they have a, it's like a bib and brace, they have a harness like this and um, covered in bells and uh, animal parts, so quite often 
wild boar tusks, sometimes skins of things. Um, I have one upstairs which has got um, eagle claws and eagle's feet and uh, wild boar tusks and the skin of a mongoose. Um, so this is a one-sided drum that the mother shaman are playing and it's got like a baby figure here, or like a small child and behind more bells, more magic amulets and bells all around the waist so they, ha they often have a bell chain around the waist bells coming down like this, like a bib and brace and you attach it at the back and then a, a very amazing crown of feathers um, coming around like that so the, the crowns of feathers are usually made up of three different parts they come out like this um, and they have, they're made of like uh, wild chicken feathers and um, sometimes eagle owl and sometimes eagle as well um, so usually three different layers so because it's got a child figure it makes me think it's possible it's the shaman with a child but it's also possible that it's uh, ban Banjakri, the wild shaman, who's like the shamanic tutor. So there's a lot of really beautiful and interesting stories about uh, Banjakri um, either abducting children or children finding him and then having magical experiences. And um, he, he's a shapeshifter, so he can change shape change size, change time. So the shaman, the child then learns with Banjakri for what seems like months or years um, and then they find he's just been missing or she's just been missing for two or three days, um, sometimes even for an hour. So you get these very interesting uh, stories and I've met a number of um, Banjakri shaman here who tell me incredibly vivid stories about how Banchakri had the long hair and he was like a little man who's very hairy and, and uh, sometimes very large, sometimes very small, um, doing things like reaching up into the bamboo that's in the roof that's very high, so it's sort of 20 foot high and then he's a small man, the same, a little bit bigger than, than they are as a child. Um, and he's married traditionally to Lem Lemna. So Lem Lemna is like the Balinese Ranga, uh, queen of the witches, and she's um, like a very evil character who, um, who tries to eat the children. And uh, Banjakri is very kind and protects the children. So you have these, um, these stories that run through the, the Ban Banjakri mythology of the of of the wife being able to smell the children in the house and uh, looking for them and, and Banjaki hiding them with his magic, hiding them under baskets and hiding them up the chimney and various other, other places um, and the wife searching and him always swalking her, um, her search to, to eat them. So in mythological terms, that's like the, the terrifying mother figure. The, the idea of the sort of the devouring mother that, that actually consumes the children. Well, Banjakri is like the playful, creative uh, magician, a bit like the magician in the, in the, um, uh, in the tarot, where he's, he's a slightly trickster, but very, very playful, very joyful, uh, very inventive. This is to mother people with the feather headdress and crown. This is actually where the, the metal will have been poured in. It would have been made in wax first, beeswax from the, probably from the wild bees. And big bells for protection like a, a harness that they wear across the waist, across the chest and tied at the back. And another, it's like worn a bit like a bib and brace, another bell chain all the way around the waist for protection and to call the spirit world. And then a child figure he's holding in his left hand and a drum in the right hand with a drumstick in the hand. He's sitting down. This is a shaman altar piece from the mugger people.
very, very beautiful, very old. So, in Nepal, the witchcraft is largely seen as negative, but obviously you get good, good witches and bad witches. So sometimes the witches and the shaman work together, particularly on certain types of healing. Other times the witches are, uh, are, and then they're, are working in a more negative way. Um, and some, quite a, a number of the healings I've seen have been connected to possession from witchcraft, um, where the person's energy has been stolen and, and there a lot of mental, mental health problems in the pool are um, attributed to witchcraft. So this, this piece, also from far west Nepal, um, most extraordinary figure, very, very heavy because they've been cast in raw iron where the, the smelting actually happens in the jungle. They'll find somewhere where they get little, little uh, iron nuggets and then they smelt them down and um, the shaman will be maybe in the jungle doing this for months at a time and digging out the little bits of iron and then burning, uh, burning the wood and making charcoal and, and then gradually smelting it. So this figure is extraordinary because it's got these two sort of spirit figures either side on the right and left and he's in a sort of praying meditation position. Um, again it's possible that it's a uh, it's possible that these are, the, are like guardian spirits. It's also possible that this is also another Banjakri representation because of the children. This is a Magga shaman figure. Again cast in probably iron, although there were little traces of, uh, of bronze as well. So the shaman often goes into the forests and jungle and mines out the raw metal themselves and then they spend many months um, smelting the metal that they've found um, use it, using charcoal, so making charcoal in, in the jungle just sort of encamped, so sometimes when I've been travelling in the mountains you look out into the jungle and there's a little um, trail of smoke coming from somewhere in the distance and uh, so far I haven't actually managed to get to them because it's although the distance looks like a day's walk or half a day's walk it's often several days walk because the terrain is so rough so you have a praying figure with the ears and the eyes the metal would have come in through the top here into the top of the head very very strange because you have two smaller praying figures either side um, they might be spirit figures, possibly they represent uh, Banjakri with children that the shaman is training. So very, very beautiful, very interesting and simple, naive, wonderful. So this uh, mugger shaman altar figure is cast in metal. You can see it would have been made in wax first and then uh, poured, um, probably using a, um, a clay mould which is then broken away from the, the metal after, after pouring it. And then the shrine, it's very, very unusual, I've never seen another one like this. They have little loops and the shrine is um, flattened down metal where it's been hammered flat and then rolled over. Um, into little tubes and a similar thing for the pinnacle here and the same for the roof. It's a very very interesting figure, um, praying shaman figure from far west Nepal and you can see the traces of um, traces of tikka and other powders that they've put in as offerings. I'm guessing they might well have had another figure even or something that they put in there because this is this area inside is very very covered in red red powder and actually traces of red powder all over and then little they've glued on hair onto the main top of the the face so very very nice very rare and unusual figure so 
this is a, a bronze shamanic figure um, from an area um, up from Jadricot. So there's a lot of shaman in that area, which are called Dami. Um, it's a very, very uh, remote part of Nepal. Um, I have a friend who goes there and has, well, her family's there, and she's um, it's two days in a bus, sometimes three days in a bus, and then three days walking to get to her. So this, this figure is very unusual because it comes with a, a three-legged throne with a sort of triangular design at the back and there's three legs all made of bronze and then the shaman itself has uh, the boots that have been made separately to the original uh, casting and the shaman has four arms and in each arm are different attributes so he's got a bell and what looks like a lotus, and a conch, and a trishal or trident. And then he's got a big moustache and a mala with uh, like probably a big sun hanging down as a protector. And then on his shoulder, another trishal and long plaits at the back or dreadlocks at the back where the shaman quite often they, they'll cut the rest of their hair but they'll leave a very very long plait at the back to, uh, to show that they're a shaman or a dami got little markings for a waist for his trousers and a big long mala um, maybe a big bell chain or a, a mala of Rudraska and he's blowing his conch so the conch is a symbol for clear communication and it's used in a lot of the, the rituals for calling the ancestors, for announcing that it's the beginning of something, for sending the spirits off on their way. The bell also is used um, sometimes as a, a, a timing marker when they're doing mantra. Um, sometimes it, it indicates the, the division between different rituals. Um, I have a very nice collection of shaman bells and uh, other ritual bells which I've, I've also made a video about. The lotus is a symbol of, um, of Buddhism and also the rising of consciousness from the mud into the light and uh, it's a symbol for transcendence and illumination and uh, the arising of beauty from, from raw matter. So. That would make me think that the shaman might also be uh, Buddhist as well as um, as well as shamanic. A lot of shaman from uh, far west Nepal are also Buddhist, although they're sometimes Hindu as well. So you you have a, a lot of tribes from that sort of area where they've originally come from Tibet. Um, so very very interesting figure. The trident or trishal is a symbol for Shiva. And, uh, and also for the triple energy channels going up the back. So you have this trident here. For, so the central channel and the two channels either side. Um, so Shiva is often depicted with a trident and trident on his shoulder as well, on the, on the left shoulder. The bell, the conch, the trident. The sun, the mala, another mala, and a, a lotus flower. And on top, he's got a shamanic crown, which is quite like the, again, the Buddhist crowns that they have. This one's not, not got the feathers like some other ones. Um, a very, very beautiful, beautiful shaman figure made of bronze. A long bell mala, and then a Rudraska mala with a, a big sun disc for protection. Or maybe it's a could be a shamanic mirror to protect the shaman and to reflect away any negative energy. You can see he's holding a bell and a lotus and a conch and a three-piece trishal for Shiva. And then there's another trident trishal on his, on his uh, shoulder 
crown, big moustache, and the long hair plaits, like dreadlocks at the back, showing that he's ashamed. Little waist. Very, very nice and very unusual. It came with a figure of Garuda with a, a Naga. Very extraordinary Garuda. So he's on a sort of lotus throne. He's kneeling, which is a, a, a typical thing you get on the top of a lot of temples. You have a, a, like a very big um, a column and then a, a capital on top of it and a Garuda kneeling on top usually in gold. So this, this Garuda is holding a Naga, a snake god, wrapped around, holding that in, in his, uh, it's come under his right hand, got big bracelets, the wings are there. You can see it's like a human figure but with a beak. And uh, very nice costume coming down, a sort of tail and wings and a crown. So this would relate to the shamanic journeying, the shamanic flying from uh, one dimension of reality to another. And um, the shamans sometimes use things like uh, hornbill skulls um, or representations of hornbill skulls to tune them in to that energy of, uh, of flying from one world to another. So very, very beautiful, very interesting. And this is a depiction of Garuda cast in bronze. It's part of a shamanic um, three-piece altar set. So you see his wings and his beak here. It's like a human figure with wings and a beak and a tail and a big belt and necklaces. He's wearing a big sun disc on his chest. So Garuda is also like a sun god and he's got a, a large naga or snake wrapping round and coming up just under his praying hands. So very, very interesting. So Garuda and naga are seen as relatives, um, both coming from eggs and sometimes the relationship is very friendly and helpful with the Garuda being the, like the king of the air and the Naga being the king of the earth, under the earth and the, the waterways. And uh, you've got this lotus petal design around the bottom. And a crown, triple crown on top. Very, very, very beautiful. There was another figure, which is the shaman's wife. So she's there assisting him in the, in the ceremony. She might well be a shaman herself. Um, very naive figures with these little eyes, big ears, wide mouth, little breasts that have been made out of little balls of wax and then cast. And she got praying figures, perhaps that would have been holding something before that's been broken off and then she's wearing a big, a big mala herself. So she's probably a shaman figure as well. And then her skirt coming all the way down, very, very nice. So she would be working with him in the ceremony. Quite often you get a pairing like that where they're both shaman in their own right and one will take the lead in a particular ritual and then the other might take a lead in another ritual. So I've worked with both women shaman and men shaman. Um, there are more men shaman in Nepal than women shaman but in some traditions there are a lot of women shaman. So um, it, it's... Uh, and I've, I've seen in some rituals actually lots more women shaman than men as well. But overall, it's some, some, some different groups have a more male shaman, like the guru. Um, shaman, yeah, so the Rai community also have a lot of women shaman. Um, so, and the, the Dami from West Nepal also have women shaman. So very, very, very interesting. So these will have been cast They'd have been made in wax first and then covered with a, a clay mould and then uh, 
that would have been fired in the process of firing the mould the, the wax melts out and then they pour the wax in so it's called a lost wax technique they pour the wax in and you can see on the top of her head the the place where the wax the, the metal would have been poured in and then they've cut it off this triple piece came with uh, um, three pieces so you've got the the shaman and his stool that he's sitting on or his his throne the garuda and then his wife who's also a shaman so she's you see her breasts here she's in a praying position perhaps it may have held something before i don't know a skirt a sort of big mouth and big ears a crown and long long braided plaited hair down the back and then a long Radraska necklace. So the shaman, you get male and female shaman and uh, in this situation it looks like the, the wife is assisting the, the uh, husband because she's been made as a smaller figure. Um, but you often get uh, couples who are shaman and um, they're often very equal. Sometimes the woman is more powerful than the man. Sometimes the man more powerful than the woman. So they help and assist each other in the different rituals. Um, the woman might do a lot more things related to childbirth. Um, maybe the man does a lot more things fighting um, demonic and uh, ghosts and things like that. Um, but I have a, a number of male and female shaman friends from all sorts of different traditions. This is um, from an area of far west Nepal, up above Jarakot. So probably several days walk up into the mountains and made of bronze. I'm making a series of documentaries here in Nepal. I've been here for five and a half years now, making a, a large series on all the festivals of Nepal and um, also another series on shamanism in the Himalayas um, and I've decided to make a, at least a hundred videos um, about the shamanic objects and other ritual objects which I'll be posting up this year so um, if you're interested and you want me to make a video about a particular object or to speak on a particular subject um, do contact me, my, my name's Paul Wilkinson you can find me on my YouTube channel and uh, on Facebook and other places. So uh, do subscribe to the channel and let me know what you're interested in. Thank you.